And yes, now we're recording. Okay, so welcome to 40th Podcast. Susie Powell Ruse, right? Ruse? Yeah, yeah. Ruse is good. That's great. Perfect, kid boy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a, welcome. It's an honor, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> an officer and a gentleman. So, um, Susie, you're, you're, this is going down in the Legend series. I don't know if you noticed, like, I started off with Judd, Titans of Terror. Okay, yeah. Let me call them Legends, right? Oh, boy. So, I think know? that's just code for, like, you're old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, former, I'm trying to, I, I actually, I didn't do my due diligence and I forgot to look up more of his stats, but like from my memory, since I remember you from high school, because we're not that yeah. far. I, don't think. I, I know it's funny. I actually, I was reading up on you before our inter, our, our chat today. And uh, I, I'm like, oh, I thought I was way older than Kibway. But <laughs> I, think, I think when you're younger too, even five years, like when you're in high school or college, it seems like an eternity because, um, you know, when you're done with college and someone's still in high school, that's such a big oh, developmental yeah. gap, you know? So I think it seemed like we were further apart in age than maybe, you know, now later in life, it doesn't seem like such a big gap. Yeah, I think so too. So, um, high school, former high school record holder, but you had it. Yep. Long. long time. A Anna Jelmini is the one who broke it right. back in, um, right. I want to so say like, 09. It was 181, like 55 something. Uh, oh, 188. Anna, I threw 189. Yeah. 188, 189. And then Anna, I don't remember what Anna threw. I think it was, you know, like in the nineties and then Shelby Vaughn I came along and I think smashed it pretty good. And I don't remember, I don't even know. I, truthfully like i'd have to look up what the what the record is now but um, cool and then check. you went to ucla your your national champ and all-american olympian yep. and yeah the u.s record holder after it had been standing for i don't know a long time yeah yeah uh, yeah 221 and it was uh 222 i broke it the first time at uc san diego um with a 69 meter throw so 69 44 227 and then it was rescinded on a technicality on the field um not not having the allowable degree of slope which right. uh was really it was like, out to like i don't know 75 or something right wasn't that where it sloped was that way yeah exactly forward? so for years i mean for years people have been going to ucsd and having you know perfectly legal marks and then, um, of course, when you smash a record like that, you know, there's, it has to be ratified correctly. And um, right out towards the left sector, it starts to drop off. Uh, and, and the IAAF stipulations are, are very, very strict. And so, you know, the note by the, the mark is, you know, field exceeded degree of slope. And the crappy thing about that is, is that translates to like, we were throwing off a cliff downhill, oh, yeah. you know, it doesn't, tra it, people don't understand. It's hardly perceptible to the eye, but you know, how it gets read and, and, and perhaps perceived at least at the time when I was throwing is like, yeah, guys are downhill throwers, huh? It's like, no, yeah, we've been doing there for years. And anyway, so, um, but it's nice to see that UC San Diego invested and, you know, made that field nice and level and still a great place to throw. Actually, I'll be down there. Um, this spring for uh, the junior college team we're going to go to the triton invite so oh, go yeah. back and Please visit those old stomping uh yeah so i'm i'm doing some uh, well throws coach out at modesto junior college uh, okay. as of this year and um just kind of having fun with that getting back into the sport a little bit and doing some coaching mm. i need to learn hammer kibway so yeah. i'm gonna yeah, be yeah, yeah we'll make it happen the last doing your time next camp you're giving, you're, giving, you're giving me um uh nightmares here the last time i competed at modesto Dylan Armstrong beat me on his last throw and hammer. Oh yeah, that's how long. That's it not was. a good. That's not a good day. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, man, we've all been there, Kibway, in one form yeah. or fashion. You know, you be, you're in the sport long enough, you have ups and downs, and some of them are you wish you could forget. You end up getting beat by kids who were in diapers when you first started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Oh man. That's okay, good. so um, yeah, so. Nice intro. Thank you for joining us. And tell me, like, let's let's get into it. I don't know how much you um, are aware of, of the podcast. Like, I'm not 
terribly interested in like you know what you did for sets and reps and yeah <laughs> right workout that you run going into usas um yeah i kind of know a little bit more about you about your i guess not a, only journey of how you got into throwing but like how that impacted you and and like you know so so like tell me like yeah. where, kind of where you started and how that got going. yeah so i started uh at age 10 and really just to to run track distance of all things Ooh. to stay yeah to stay in shape for soccer and um i so i would run like three thousand meters eight eight hundred meters and then one day after running practice my dad said hey Susie, why don't you try the discus and i was like no i don't think so because uh you know i'm 10 years old I'm tall, I'm thin, and all the discus throwers I had ever seen, which was probably like three, because <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there were no internet machines at the time. Uh, I was like, mm, yeah, that doesn't fit the bill, Dad. But he uh, I told the story a thousand times, but he, co he coerced me with Slurpees or some sort of food, which I'm still very much food driven. You can pretty much get me to do anything if you promise food at the end of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I tried it and was very good at it or you know, I always liked throwing things so I'm the youngest of six and I have four brothers and a sister that are all ahead of me and so my brothers are much older and when they would come home to visit we would play catch or we we're always out playing some sports so I've always been very athletic and attracted to sports since you know a young age and you know maybe it was a way to bond with my siblings or something I don't know but I've always loved to throw stuff and so discus came very natural to me in terms of just liking to throw something um and then you know consequently i learned javelin only two years later so i threw javelin for a long time as well that's right you're um, yeah i was all right through like 180 179 11 that's yeah. super annoying but um <laughs> and it was second nc's one of the years <clears throat> i i don't want to mention the year anyway uh so that's how i got into throwing not on purpose and then it was it turned into something where you know i was good at it and success begets success and when you're little i think well any age frankly but especially when you're young and there and i was a good basketball player as well so i was a, a very good athlete anyway but discus was something that i excelled in and for a young person that's a very powerful thing and um that's what kept me interested i never really was like oh man i, I just love throwing discus i think i just really loved being excellent or thought i could be excellent and i saw throwing as a way to get me places i saw throwing as a way to get me to college and then you know as not at age 10 necessarily was i thinking about the olympics but as i progressed in my um career you know obviously the olympics became more of a reality so that's how i started as a runner <clears throat> driven by slurpees to that's, throw some discus that's kind of interesting so do you think that perspective did it change over the years? Like you started? Yes. Oh, for team. sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because at some point, and, and this, I'm sure you can relate to this. At some point, you have to take ownership of why you're doing the sport, yeah. particularly post-collegiately. You know, <laughs> when you graduate and all of a sudden all that support is sort of um, no longer available, you got to really have a gut check as to why you're still continuing to impoverish yourself. Or like, I mean, I that know. might be extreme, but you have to, you know, why are you putting your life on hold to pursue uh, this, this mission? And uh, fortunately, I think probably for you and myself and others uh, who did, who had a successful college career, you can see, and, and I had already made an Olympic team while at UCLA. So I, I knew I could be world-class. It wasn't like such a big, jump but um still and i think unfortunately our, our post-collegiate throwers are still going through this um you know you are putting your life on hold and it's i think it's getting harder to make a living um in the sport at least i was very eye-opening uh, last summer at um ironwood jared shared with me how difficult it is and sort of his personal mission was to help these post-collegiates through the ironwood track club um, to support them as much as he could. And I, I was actually very inspired by that because um, I, you know, I thought it was hard when I graduated, but it sounds like it's gotten more challenging to get any kind of sponsorship money um, to train post-collegiately. So uh, 
in light of that, it's really a gut check and you have to be in touch with those intrinsic things that are, are driving you. And so, you know, that's not possible at age 10, right? <laughs> you're, you're not evolved at that age yeah, to yeah, yeah. Uh, take that on. So it's more superficial, right? It's like, what can I get out of this? Right. <laughs> and, and I mean, I think my story is a little similar because I started, I, I was a sprinter and yeah. my family, I don't think I've talked about this yet, but like, so my family, it's a track family, Olympics. My grandparents have been to every summer Olympics Really? Except for one since 1976. Wow. Track so is in the family, right? And so yeah. once growing up and kind of becoming aware of like what that is and every four years and everyone's excited. Right. And, and um, you know, and you're seeing, I don't know, Carl Lewis and, you know, all these other guys. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it's inspiring. <laughs> Looking flashy and someone's like, I'm going to be an Olympian. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I kind of assumed Olympic sprinter, obviously, but like, <clears throat> yeah. But like, uh -huh. it, I think it was absolutely more like Olympian, and anyway, so sprinting for all those years and totally happenstance. I, it sounds like like you, you know, I'm just kind of like chilling on the track, and dude's like, "Hey, why don't you throw this shot put?" And um, and um, being like, "Well, sure, okay, but that's not what I'm supposed to do, but I can." And yeah. I take a throw and then it's better than the other kids on the team. So it's like, nah, why don't you stay here and try it out? Um, yeah. But even at that point, it's, it wasn't, um, this is, this is where my career and my life is going to go. It was, this is really fun. So I'll do this for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And there's less running, you know, <laughs> at least yeah. for me, there was, yeah. uh, but I'm sure, you know, all that sprinting obviously helped develop the kind of athlete that you are as well. I, you know, I, I mean, you watch you watching you throw. I'm like, damn, dude's fat. You know, even I remember meeting you. Were you in high school? I, it was at that. I don't remember the clinic in Sacramento when I first met you. I think um, that was. I was. You still uh, in high school? More park then. Oh, okay. It was. Well, I think yeah. I actually I wanted to touch on that in this conversation too. That was, <laughs> that was my first year at More Park, so I was okay. Nineteen, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I might have been twenty. I don't know, but yeah. That was pretty young. Yeah, but so certainly, you know, extremely athletic, super wiry, and fast. You know, you can tell. To a fault. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. So, yeah, you can get on board with that, huh? Um, so, I think, like, have you had to deal with, um, or how have you, maybe, if I can assume, like, just female thrower stereotypes? Um, yeah <clears throat> I can share like well, I know that I've gotten that sort of thing like from my parents too once throwing got a little bit more um involved person and I kept doing it you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I would get that you shouldn't be throwing that's for fat kids uh dude right right <laughs> like what are you talking about yeah oh man there's a good story here oh, I think it's funny anyway so I think um my dad <laughs> you know my dad was my coach up until I went to UCLA and um so he got me weightlifting actually in seventh grade, but it was like Nautilus machines, you know, like circuit training because it was like the eighties and or late eighties or whatever, early nineties and that other oh no, ladies. And like, that, that's what was popular at the time. And so <clears throat> he was concerned that as I got to be a better athlete, I would be afraid to lift weights because <laughs> of the perception of being, you know, big and, yeah. um, you know, this is also when the, if you were to see a female discus thrower or shot putter at the Olympics, you might be like, hmm, <laughs> you know, this is the crime eighties sort of performance enhancing era. Right. <laughs> and, um, so are you familiar with the movie pumping iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger and okay. Every thrower like probably knows that. Right. Okay. Well, did you know there's a pumping iron too? <laughs> yes. um, okay. I think you've seen it once because Chris. Oh yeah. Okay. It. So how's this for okay? And as a dad, now you can appreciate this. So my dad's like thinking he must have been thinking to himself. Okay, I'm gonna get my daughter comfortable with bot like strong female body images. So I'm gonna take my daughter and my wife to Pumping Iron Two. It was in the theaters, Kibway. Still, Ooh. we walk into the movie theater. 
there's like a married woman too, you know, like making out or something. We're like the only people in the movie theater. <laughs> and, you know, they're women, they're female bodybuilders and God bless them. But if you're trying to like convince your young daughter that getting strong is not scary and pretty, <laughs> that may have been the wrong movie. Anyway, <laughs> so dad takes me to Pumping Iron Part 2, the female version, to try to get me comfortable with getting strong. Anyway, so speaking of, of stereotypes of bodies and, and female throwers and getting strong, you know, I think from a young age, my dad tried, my parents, both my parents, tried to uh, alleviate any fears of, you know, being too bulky or you know at the end of the day for a female it's like worrying about being unattractive or something and so i didn't really carry a lot of that baggage not because of pumping iron part two but just because um we should plug you know right now <laughs> <laughs> anyway so i think i was always on the you know other side of the spectrum i i think i always felt a little insecure that i wasn't looking more like a thrower, you know, especially in college. I, the, my UCLA teammates were kind of brutal teasing me about looking like a distance runner. And so um, I didn't personally have a lot of those struggles I, more in reverse is sort of feeling like I didn't fit in. But um, at the same time, you know, I, I didn't really care because if I could throw far at yeah. that point, you know, who that's, cares that's, what it looks like. Throwing far is a pretty good equalizer. And, and exactly the, and yeah I, I can definitely get on board with that and then it kind of becomes more about the other person who's doing the teasing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah me. for sure and i think too like sort of those insecurities about being strong and big mm -hmm. <clears throat> were a theme throughout my whole career as i look back that whenever i let those insecurities get the best of me and i tried to get I, mean, I always try to develop a certain amount of base level strength and I don't want to go into the weeds on all that, but, um, and, and gain weight and all that. If I went too far in that direction, I didn't throw as far. So it's right. like, it slowed me down and it weighed me down. So, you know, there's like a sweet spot for my body type to be explosive and throwing to throw far and, uh, you know, strength to body ratio, that sort of thing. I think we're probably better indicators of performance than just like, how much could I squat and how much did I weigh, you know? But even knowing that I could still let those insecurities get the best of me and redirect some training to try and fit an arch you know, the archetype of a, of a discus thrower. So you, you, despite our best efforts, sometimes we still fall prey to these things, right? And yeah. um, I was no better than anyone else in terms of, you know, letting those things get to me sometimes. So did you have any, I don't know, tips, tricks, or tools that you use, or did it just kind of naturally, like, eventually kind of fall away? In, ter in terms of? Like, when it got to you, you know what I mean, in the moment? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't think it was something, like, at the forefront of my mind. And I think it's, it has taken me in my retirement to kind of figure it out. But... Um, Certainly like at UCLA, there was a couple, there was like my last, maybe, yeah, towards my last, my senior year, Art was like, you got to put on some weight. <laughs> and I was like, all right, coach. And uh, I mean, it was back in the day too, where I swear we didn't have as good of like supplementation, like uh, thoughts on nutrition were a lot different. And so it was just, it wasn't like productive weight. And okay, read fat, you know, I felt like I got a little fat. And I just didn't move as well. And so, um, you know, was there an antidote to it? No, I think, you know, I learned from that particular circumstance at UCLA, but it, there were always sort of traces of like, oh, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough. That, I, that was always a theme. Yeah, that's, I mean, being in a power sport, man, because I think you just kind of end up getting that and, and the assumed answer to being better is getting bigger and stronger. And that's not always the case. That's why I like, that's right. People ask me and, 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 and again, like most things, like as I've gotten older, older, um, I think you kind of start to understand a little bit better about like what's going on there. So I think like, yeah, the best blanket statement is 
not only whatever works for you, but like just kind of experimenting with things. So like you said, if, 100%. if, if you're at, you know, weight X and then you add a 10 to that and your throwing goes down, well, X plus 10 is probably not where you should be. You know what I mean? Like Exactly, <laughs> it's exactly. Just, it's one of those things that I think gets kind of ignored because the overall I don't know, culture says big and strong. And, and that's why, like, for the most part, there is nothing wrong with that. So long as, you know what I mean? You're kind of paying attention and observing what's going on because that is not best for everyone. Yeah. And I think it's, I think anything in terms of um, fitness is like, it's goal driven. I mean, what are you trying to accomplish? I mean, if you're trying to throw far, then everything you do should be geared towards throwing far. Exactly. If you're trying to be big and strong and squat, 700 pounds and you should be focused on that right that should drive your training so you know let the goal drive the training process not just some arbitrary you know like i said mythical image of what a th whatever thrower should look like um i saw maybe i can't remember if it was an article or um maybe it was just a post from kara winger about how she had, and I had done this too in my career, got really lean, right? Dropped a bunch of weight, got the, the strength to body ratio super high, um, but didn't throw as far or, you know, so you can go the other way too. So I think athletes that have, or, you know, professionals that have any kind of length in their career have had to find that sweet spot, yeah. you know, weight and strength and all that. I, I tried to do that too. <laughs> yeah, like, this, right. This was, this sure. was after like the, I don't know, the three or four year period where I was throwing. Uh, I don't know. I think I had three years of 77 plus. And so it was after, it was after those three years. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had just yeah. came out of like the, the really bad period of like, what's going on with my body? This is all crazy, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. So, I'm coming back up and I had lost some weight, like just on accident. And yeah. then I kind of tried to use that as like, well, I mean, it doesn't really, that doesn't matter. Why don't I try to like, I'm going to be like the lightest guy to, to throw really, really far. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. Know, at all times. Uh -huh. all, like I think the off is just a hair under 200 pounds. Like that's not happening for me. You wow. know what I mean? Um, and Koji at his at his eighty four eighty six, he was two fourteen. I'm like, well, I could probably, yeah, let me aim for you know, I don't know, eighty at two fourteen or something like that. Right. I just, I just couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it just, it just didn't work for me. Like my kind of sweet spot, honestly, is probably high two twenties, and like, and that's that's a big difference for, I guess, just kind of how my engine is. You know what I mean? For sure. Um, yeah, just an example. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And, um, you know, I think any thrower, like I said, that has a, a longer career has to find out those things for themselves. You know? I think I love that because ultimately most people have to find the thing out for themselves. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, as I think we keep referencing our age. Um, but in my experience, like, just telling someone isn't both either personally with me or, or, you know, just observing it in other people and other coaches and stuff. It just, it just doesn't usually work. And even if it does, it's still not as powerful as the athlete actually going through that themselves. And right. Them. Like that's, that's the buy-in is when you do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, of the role as the coach now too, especially developmental, it's hard because you do have to give them a, a, a blueprint and a, <clears throat> a framework from which to operate, right? You have to give them a technical framework, but um, the more that you can enable the athlete to feel things for themselves and to uh, be able to manage themselves mentally in the competitions and even in practice, the better. You're doing them a favor. I mean, <clears throat> that's really, I look at, you know, as a coach, what's the biggest gift I can give these athletes? And it's, it's a thought process, right? Mm -hmm. And how to prepare. And throwing is just our medium, you know? So, um, and hopefully if they take it seriously, then they, they 
now have um, a frame of reference for the rest of their lives. And if they don't, then, you know, on, then they don't. <laughs> yeah, and that's at least, at, at, least at my level, I mean, maybe for, you know, the division one coach, it's a little different, but for me, I'm basically right now coaching high school and high school part two. And, um, you know, just trying to teach these young athletes how to think, how to prepare. Yeah. So. Because I mean, yeah, this is great. I'm like taking notes over here. <laughs> You're funny, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So we've mentioned art in UCLA. Yes. Let's let's get into like how that was. Everyone's heard lots of stories. Yeah. Uh, for for I think and probably the majority of the listeners here have no idea about. Yeah. Really, art. I mean, there there are right. You know, there's stories of lore, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the further away that we get from art being a, um, you know, a college coach, just like any of us, the, the, the less relevant they are to the next generation, right? Unless they're, yeah. unless they're, but that's not necessarily true from art's perspective, even if the kids don't know who he is, um, his coaching influences are vast. Right. I mean, if you look at many of the top, I say, I have to say college coaches because what that's like our best system. It, well, you, you know, it, it's like it's just exactly. So you've got, you know, oh, you've got John Frazier, um, Don Babbitt. I mean, the list goes on and on um, of, of his influence and in, in coaching and throwing and, you know, even his um, time with more recently with Joe Kovacs. Um, anyway, I, you know, I listened to uh, one of the podcasts with Joe Kovacs and uh, I've never met Joe, but I was like, I know what you're talking about, my brother. I, <laughs> I, I got to get in touch with him someday and, and, and have there. a chat. But uh, I, I, anyway, it was fun to hear his podcast, uh, one of the podcasts and talk about his time with art. And I was like, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I, I you know, as I've mentioned many times in, in interviews and different conversations, you know, the, the current crop of high school athletes and even maybe some college don't know who art is, but, um, you know, UCLA in the eighties and nineties, we were ahead of our time in many ways and how we trained and how we, you know, the framework for technique that we had. And, um, I recently mentioned to someone that, one of the secrets I think was that everyone was so well trained that the upperclassmen helped coach the lower classmen. Or in my case, we had a lot of freshmen come in at once, um, or a lot of transfers. And David Dumble and I were the same year. And so, <clears throat> you know, when art or the team would be gone for indoors or, you know, it was time to throw shot put downstairs, David and I would be upstairs working together on breaking down technique, you know. So how amazing is that to have people like that as your teammates, you know, John Godina and Don Dumble, these people that were at the time, the best there ever was in NC2A history. And those are my teammates. And I got to learn from them and not just like where to put your right foot and where to put your left foot, but also how to prepare. And, yeah. um, you know, I was no slouch coming in either as a, a national high school record holder, but, um, I think the most beautiful thing about that time frame and what attracted me to UCLA versus like a Stanford or uh, I say Stanford, like it's a piece of crap, school, yeah, oh yeah. but you know, versus other programs, cause it was down to UCLA and Stanford <clears throat> was that at the time it was like, well, Susie, do you want to be a big fish in a big pond? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or do you want to be a little fish, a big fish in a little pond? <clears throat> and my aspirations, much like yours were always to be the big fish in the big pond. And at that time that was UCLA. And so, yeah. It had a profound impact on my development and understanding of the throws. And um, Godina and I still talk about the kind of environment and expectations there. Um, you know, you were expected to win. You know. Wow. So, <clears throat> and at all levels, it wasn't just track. It was the entire athletic, you know, department. Right. So. Which I like. Um, actually, my aunt, actually, she just retired like in the last year, but she was um, an executive assistant for the football coach for like, I don't know, 30 years. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, wow. Faisal and I don't know. Wow. Carl was there, I think, too. And like, yeah, all of, all of the coaches in the last hour. I mean, so I, I yeah. growing up like in, in the Bay Area and going to Cal games all the time, like I was a Cal fan, but I like had all this. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> On the closet. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I'd wear it and my, you know, my grandparents would get all pissy with me, but like, hey. It was like sweet UCLA gear, like you know. Yeah. I mean? like, the college kids. Did you? Did you? Were, did was she there in the era of Reebok being the sponsor? Because that was a stucky time to be uh, an athlete there. Reebok, the Reebok gear was horrible. Yeah, yeah, it totally was. I, um, she was. I think I was too young to get any of that though. Although I feel like maybe I got one thing. Yeah, but, that was yeah. a bummer. We went like from Adidas to Reebok or something. It was like, oh. yeah, but. Sorry, Reebok, if you're listening. <laughs> I'm we'll sure it's much better now with CrossFit, yes. okay? Yes, yes. CrossFit has <laughs> helped them. Um, so um, having... <laughs> this, so this must be an, an interesting contrast, having your dad as a coach in high school to art and mm-hmm. university. Well, they're both very regimented and strict and uh, <clears throat> have high expectations. So in that regard, you know, going from uh, <laughs> going from one dictator to the other wasn't such a stretch. <laughs> um, you know, it was good for me. I, you know, you have to um, you have to expand your horizons. And I really had to, um, you know, it was good to sort of divorce myself from my dad's uh, coaching not because there's anything wrong with it but you have to expand as an athlete and as a person in art and UCLA were a part of that expansion you know at the end of the day one thing you know about a parent is my dad you know and I are still best friends to this day I love my father very much and my dad always had my back you know and as the father you can appreciate that too Kibway you know your children are your children and you have their best interests at heart and you know, I don't care who the coach is, but, you know, your kid's your kid. So my dad always had that loyalty to me. And, you know, frankly, a coach doesn't have that same loyalty to you as an athlete. They just don't. And especially a coach like Art where, you know, yes, I was a, you know, sort of a, a high school phenom coming in. But at the same time, you know, he's got to replenish the stock. And, um, yeah. You know, so I was, I, I was dispensable, you know, at the end of the day in a program like that. And, um, which is totally understandable, but, you know, so nothing can really replace sort of the love and the loyalty of a, of a parent, um, even if they are not as good of a technical coach. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that. So, and then, you know, I think if used properly, it's it's basically just the natural progression of of being an athlete yeah absolutely and it can you know i mean we see it in other sports and even in our own you know it can get weird too you can have a parent um athlete relationship that gets weird but for my purposes you know my dad coached me to high school um i went to ucla had a, a run there and then my mom died of cancer my senior year which was very traumatic as you know anyone could imagine um, and it was hard on the family in general. We have a close family. And so when I graduated from UCLA, I moved home, you know, and our time with my time with art had kind of run its course as well. And it was time to move back to Northern California and reinvent myself as a thrower because, you know, it's not coincidence, but my, when my mother, my mother was sick and then she died, my career really took a hit too. And, um, so I didn't feel like I was progressing anymore under art. It had actually become a toxic situation. Um, just sort of, you know, the way UCLA was set up was, it's almost like a, you know, a throwing cult. <laughs> I've said this before. Everyone's vying for art's approval, yeah. right? Vying for it. And that's very effective to get people to perform but it's a fuel that burns very quickly and it's not sustainable. So um, I didn't see my career being over my senior year. And then, you know, of course my mom died and my thought was, well, if I can lose my mother, I can lose art, you know? 
And um, for all the great things that I had learned from him, it was just, it was time to move on. And that was very difficult. So, you know, I lost my, my coach and my mom in the same year. And um, that was a huge, massive transition. And I, I felt like I needed to just come home and center myself. And um, so I had like two years, a year and a half of really just sucking pretty bad. But the beauty, like I'm sure you've had moments where the struggle, you can't see the light, but then the struggle is a big part of the story of what got you to the next level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so <laughs> what's that? So I think I literally just wrote that somewhere like, to, like, <clears throat> but I haven't, I don't remember if I did post it or it's like one of the thousand notes that I have. But anyway, yeah. Exactly. And if you look at the Olympic creed, right, it's not, it's, it, it even says, uh, you know, that it isn't necessarily the victory or the defeat, it's the struggle. And yeah. it's true. And so that transition and that trauma of both my mom dying and then of course leaving art, that was not easy. That was very, very difficult to do at, at age 21 or two or whatever I was. And, and, you know, Godin is still there. It was still there. All these great throwers were still there. So like, I'm the idiot, right. For leaving. And, um, but that was the reason I was able to go back to Northern California and hooked up with a strength coach that was very instrumental in getting me extremely fit and explosive again, because I'd kind of lost that, you know, I went into that sort of let's get big and strong and slow framework and then had to work myself back out and then by the year 2000 I so that was like my mother died in 98 and uh in the fall of 98 and by you know Olympic trials in 2000 I was throwing 65 meters again and top 10 in the world and so all those things had to happen right it would not have happened staying where I was it was just not it wasn't going to happen so Again, you know, post collegiates that might be listening, um, or you're approaching your senior year, you got to figure out where the best spot for you to continue to be the best version of yourself is going to be. And and trust me, I, when my mother was still alive, she's like, Suzanne, why don't you just come back home and train with your dad? And I was like, uh, uh. I was <laughs> like, no way. There's no way I'm coming back to Modesto training with dad. I, you know, I had a boyfriend at UCLA. You know, I had, I had like a life down in Los Angeles and it's like, I'm not coming back to freaking Modesto. Are you kidding me? Like those, mom, those days are over. And then she died. I'm like, yeah, all bets are off. All options are open. What do I need to do to make myself grow far again? You know? So. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think what... that's about as candid as I think anyone speaks about the program at UCLA. <laughs> oh, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, and just, yeah, personal conversations over the years and, you know, five hour lunches in OTC with, with Art himself. It's, um... <laughs> yeah, he's an amazing coach. He really is. Yeah. He's done, if you look at his credentials, it's, it's hard to find a better coach. I, I think to piggyback on what you just said, like, especially when kind of reaching out to, um, post collegiates is like searching for like what's best for you. It's not always going to be the, the place with the bells and whistles. <laughs> That's you know? true. And just because all of the resources are there and available to you won't always mean um, you as an athlete will be able to reach whatever that potential is. It's um, right. I think we're kind of in an era now, perhaps more than ever, or perhaps not. Maybe it's the same, but like because social media and blah, 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 it's, it's just more focused on, but of people, athletes, generally younger ones, wanting an answer or the answer. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and when told, I mean, you know, it's, it's not really that simple. You kind of mm -hmm. have to figure it out for yourself, which, which, then provides like an element of time but it's like it's time that's like well it might or it might not or like right there's nothing there's nothing structured about it and i think that scares a lot of people <laughs> yeah it is scary yeah and some it is scary that and it's like uh and some people are just like no no way hard out i'm not doing that you know what i mean 100 percent. yes it's not worth the risk right 
Yeah, and I mean, I think, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, I have a lot of frustration with, you know, even the athletes that I'm coaching at the junior college because, you know, they see certain images, you know, on social media or YouTube or whatever, and they, they think they get it. And they, it's like, no, it's going to take you a long time. It's a lot of work. And, you know, it's not for everyone. Um, but they do want it now. And because they saw whomever talk about the throw and connection, that's my favorite buzzword is connection. Yeah. Um, but they don't know what that means yeah. and they've never felt it and they don't really even know how to apply force to the implement. So it's like, don't worry about what your all the image. It's great. You're seeing some of these imagery, the, the imagery on the whatever device, whatever, whomever you're watching, but you actually have to do hours and, and hours of work to, to feel that. And it takes years. Um, so you have to temper those expectations too. Just because you conceptually understand the event doesn't mean you know how to throw. Right. Just like me and hammer, like I conceptually understand hammer throwing. It's quite like, simple. Uh, like uh, yeah. conceptually. You just throw far. <laughs> yeah. throw no, far. I don't even mean that. I just mean like to be able to. So, I mean, I like the word connection and feeling. I do too. I do too. But it is just, it is just bastardized because it's like, yeah, you were connected on that throw. Well, that can mean a shit ton of things. That could mean where, where did you lose the connection? And then how does one gain it back or how, like, you know what I mean? So it's just, it, to me, it's a really easy word to say um, without context, you know? Um, you're starting to talk about, Yes, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> okay. First of all, second of all, yes, I, I do think that's kind of a thing with just throws coaching in general. Um, but because there are so many throws coaches, I don't know if I can really blame it. Like, you know what I mean? Like I won't, you know, now I'm, a, I'm around a lot more high school coaches for a couple months before I move into more, uh, you know, other stuff like USATF wise. And um, yeah. And, and like, there is a lot of like, oh yeah, just do this. Or so like, you can say, just connect. You just gotta connect to it. Yeah. Right. What, what, is, what does that mean to the kid? You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. there is a lot to be said for just throwing a word out. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, so, I mean, and anyway, not to like go down the rabbit hole on that. I'm not mad at it, you know. I'm just saying, I think it's a real easy term for it's like a coverall, you know, like, uh, let me, let me throw that on it. <laughs> you weren't connected. Also, like, okay. also um, I, I have to mention, have you, have you seen dodgeball? Yes, of course. Okay. No, you, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but like, see these lines on my face? Of course I've seen dodgeball. I'm old. <laughs> yeah. You basically, you just sounded exactly like white Goodman. It's like, yeah. What do you mean? Cool. Come on. Come on. <laughs> duck, dodge, <laughs> duck, dodge. <laughs> well, it, interestingly <laughs> enough, Kibway, I do throw wrenches at the athletes if they're not hitting you the do. right positions in the right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So is that from your dad or from Art? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. From my dad. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about feelings of connection. Um, are you big on drills? Yes, no, why, why not? Yes, I am big on drills, and for, especially for beginning athletes. And the reason why is <clears throat> I feel like it helps development of proprioception through the feet, ankles, and calves. Um, and I feel like it, so with that, be, you learn to body control and how to move from the ground up so that's to me that's the biggest advantage of a lot of the drills is learning how to control the balance weight distributions and how to move the feet um and to me that's just very fundamental because i don't think what i'm seeing is unless they've played other sports athletically these I call them kids, they're not kids, but athletically, you know, they're not as maybe developed because they didn't do as many sports or, you know, I just feel like at least the athletes that I see, yeah. um, 
some of those things are not quite as developed. So um, if they can demonstrate, I, I dare not use the word mastery, but if they can demonstrate, you know, an ability to control the, the, the body and balance from the ground up, um, to me, that's a very helpful stepping stone and, and of moving through the ring or even the runway. Yeah. Um, I know you, how about you, Kev? Wait, yeah. Are you a drill kind of guy or? You know, I kind of go in phases. <laughs> I think, and, and for me, it also depends on um, the event. Yes, so, I would think I, so. Yeah, and I spend a lot of time in discus, um, of course. And I think I did a lot more drills there, but I was also younger. Um, mm -hmm. And Hammer, I mean, you know Coach Mac, like we did every single exotic no, yeah <laughs> obvious you know what i mean underwater like we did we did everything um, yeah some of those uh, i mean i could probably even say most of those are beneficial but i think there's a certain element as far as hammer is concerned that removes the movement mm -hmm. like the overall movement of the throw to focus on like one thing that may or may not matter during an actual throw yeah uh, that's how For I feel sure. personally with regards to hammer. And so, but that doesn't mean I don't like drills. I do like drills because like, certainly, like, yeah. You know, I think when you're developing someone, you have to teach them. Well, yeah. yeah and that's just it. Um, like with beginners, athletes who have never thrown it before. And then, you know, beginners up to, you know, a training age of whatever, but you know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's absolutely necessary um, to do that. Me personally, I don't do them as much anymore. But when I do, like if I'm in a bit of a funk and I'm just like, oh God, I gotta, I gotta change something, then I'll, you know, I'll spend a little bit of time. Um, I didn't do much with Dr. B. Like the first. Yeah, I wouldn't think you would. I wouldn't think you would. I'm actually curious about your time with Dr. B. <clears throat> oh boy, then we're gonna have to have a part two because that's gonna be like. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll have an Art Venegas uh, Dr. B exchange. Yes. <laughs> hey, but you have to talk like Venegas and I'll talk like Dr. B. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I don't know if his voice is actually that high. It might be. I, anyway. um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, yeah, when I first got there, I, I did drills for, I don't know, maybe half of practice for about three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then maybe one other time where I was sucking real bad. And he was like, dude, you gotta like, we gotta, we gotta scale it back. You're back to drills. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, You're was relegated like, to drill land. Yeah. I was like, Oh, I'm just trying to be all um, poopy about it. But no, I mean, it's, it's good. I, I, I do. Yeah. Drills, man. I don't, I don't, well, I'll, I'll, I'll continue talking about hammer. I don't like, a lot for hammer and, and that's the reason why yeah yeah well i would think too you know how often are you getting an athlete that even has picked up a hammer and, and they have to understand how to actually throw the implement you know yeah. whereas there's probably been some exposure to discus and shot you know somewhere along the way and maybe it's a little more i don't know if intuitive is the right word but it's a little more familiar maybe yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, hammer. Yeah, it's not like it's not like anything an athlete does in their entire life. You know, right? I mean? mm -hmm. It's very different. The starter is like you. Yeah, you turn, but like one foot stays on the ground, the other one leaves. Wait, what? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't get it. And ninety nine point eight percent of kids, like when they start when they start doing turns or whatever, right? I'm acting it out for those on, on the podcast. And, <laughs> it and, looks uh, really good, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's totally. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they turn and they go to turn and then they, then they like want to wind it over the head again. It's like, it's so, it's so interesting the things that happen yeah, to it's it's very... when, they're, when they're learning it. Um, and it's, it's, it's got to speak to something just, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a kinesthetic uh, component there. Anyway, that's enough to talk about drills um uh so we talked about i guess kind of the struggle and like what you went through and kind of in college but like coming out of, of out of ucla and then moving back home so have you ever used like sports psychology resources or reading of books or like how did you 
how did you, without getting too personal, if you don't want to, but like, how, how did you kind of get um, through that period and into good results again? And like, what, what happened there? No, Kipway, I had it all, always figured out, so I didn't need any help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so it's, you know, there's like a couple re reinventions of Susie along the way. And, um, you know, it got harder as I got older for sure. I think because also, you know, like any thrower, you're not making improvements as in the, the improvements become less uh, vast, right? The improvements now are, are smaller yeah. and the, re the rewards are also maybe a little s smaller, you know, PRs or personal, you know, personal best in the weight room, or even, you know, certainly once you throw a really world-class throw, it's, you know, it's hard to do that every day. Yeah. Particularly in an aerodynamic event where sometimes, you know, you get a little help or, um, you know, it, there's great margins of error, you know, and I would say javelin and discus. Um, so I found that as I got older, uh, the mental aspect became more important um, to deal with those things, right? To deal with like, man, I probably won't PR this year, <laughs> or I may not PR this year, yeah, but yeah. what can I still feel really good about, you know? And I can still feel really good about every time I go out there, I know I'm going to throw 63 meters. And on the top end, I'm going to throw 65. Or how do I throw 65 meters, you know, on this particular day? So, <clears throat> it, you know, the the mindset and the career become more within that context than just throwing far to throw far. You know, as a professional, you have to try to throw a certain minimum mark every time you step in the ring, right? Otherwise it's really hard to make a living. Mm -hmm. So I think things that jump out, yes, there's been books and influences that have been extremely helpful over the years. Uh, in college, I stumbled upon a book called The Magic of Believing. And that was very instrumental, I would say, you know, post-collegiately. And I, I anyway, I, I'll, I, I'm not gonna bore you guys with the story of how I came across that book, um, because it would be a reference that most of our listeners or subscribers wouldn't necessarily get. But anyway, I came across that book, it was very helpful. And then um, worked with um, a few sports psychologists over the, time frame one um oh my gosh why can't i think of her name uh gloria was her name uh she was out of chicago she actually worked with usatf um mm. i want to say in the late 90s but she anyway not when she, i worked with her not when she was working with usatf she was very helpful when you know as i went into break the american record in 2007 or whatever it was so um Yes, I have found working on the mental side of things to be very helpful without being able to claim any sort of, you know, mastery of, of that aspect. And I think for a lot of, <clears throat> for most throwers, for many athletes, sometimes that part of it is the, uh, you know, when you've had that really amazing performance, how do you keep replicating that? And, you know, now in pop culture, it's, they call it flow, right? Well, athletes were f very familiar with that concept and that, and, and are able to do it frequently. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's sort of every, it, there's this quest to try and like dial it in and systematize it. And it's a little bit more elusive than that, as, as you know. Yeah. Um, and I, th you know, that's also kind of what makes it interesting as you evolve in the sport. But um, I think I sent it to you, the inner book, of, the inner game of tennis by Timothy yes. Galloway. Yes. I, I pretty much, that's pretty much a signed reading for any athlete that I have. Yes. Um, Oddly enough, Sean Donnelly is actually the one that mentioned that book to me. Yeah, uh, it's a great one. I actually have and I, I do own it. I, I did go and buy it, um, but I haven't read it. Yeah, I mean, it's so, it's so simple in many ways, but I think for me, so in, in 2007, I was working with Dan Path. He was my coach. I learned a lot of great things with Dan. I was training at roughly, I was training around 65 meters, probably, you know, 64, 65, throwing very well. I get into my first meet at Sac State, Hornet Invite, 
and I throw like 58 meters and I'm like, what the <laughs> bleep? <laughs> and I'm serious. I'm just questioning my future. Cause I'm like, how, how bad of a choke job was that to just go from like throwing far in practice and then just like totally eating it in the meat, like really, you know, and I ha I have PR'd at Olympic trials and won as a 19 year old. So it's not like I don't know how to compete or prepare, you know, so it was mind boggling to me. So anyway, the next couple of weeks, I, I, someone suggested that book to me. So I read the book and I was like, oh yes, that's good advice. Thank you for helping me basically manage, you know, the ego and how it Wait, wants see, <clears throat> Sorry, say that again? How to manage your ego. How to manage your ego, yeah, that's- um, Right, and it's, it's something that you post about a lot and it's, yeah. it's profound. And, you know, I've had some people say, oh, Kib what the hell is Kibway talking about on his post? I'm like, you just don't get it. Like, you just, you, don't, you when you know, you know, like. Um, I'm getting that they, a lot they, and it like, it doesn't even bother me. Like, you know, no, it shouldn't, five because years they, ago, I probably would have like changed my tune a bit to. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's, um, they're just not there yet. Yeah. Oh, or they've never had to challenge themselves in an arena where they've had to draw that out of themselves. They've right. never been in a situation in life where they've had to have everything on the line and truly test their mettle and go to that level. Because a lot of people never take the risk or venture to go there. Right. And, and it's not that as an athlete, you or I or whomever high performer are better than the other person. It's just they can't relate because they don't, they've never been there. Yeah. And until you've been in that situation, you can't appreciate it you know and so you can only sort of shed the light and hope that for those that are ready they get it that it resonates that right it's not it's resonate. not for everyone yeah it's not for everyone yeah maybe you should just write the forward of my book that was, that was <laughs> <laughs> so that book was very helpful to me and it helped sort of calm down the ego it helped me throw with less emotional attachment to every single throw and I think, you know, to contrast with what we did in college and maybe what a lot of college coaches do, I know, you know, I had friends that um, went through Larry Judge's programs where it's like freaking do or die, you know, and that works, but God, it's taxing, for, for some. you know, it works when you're young, I think yeah. maybe, and you're, you know, you, your identity is so wrapped up in your throw, but it's exhausting and, you know, it just doesn't, it's not sustainable. And so um, that book helped me just sort of calm the ego. Don't worry about, you know, living or dying in every single throw. Watch yourself with detached interest and, you know, focus your attention on this exact moment. And once I was able to get better at that, I threw much farther. And then I broke the American record um, under heavy, heavy pressure from Becky Barisha at the time. I mean, she was, yeah. it was like one of, I remember that competition so clearly, like, one of us was breaking the record that day and I was like, who was going to do it first? And I, I was crapping my pants that she was going <laughs> to do it first. And uh, anyway, it's not really, but um, you know, all that to say, it definitely helped give um, the mental framework to compete uh, and to, to free myself, right. To let that inner greatness come out. And so now when I work with athletes that I, that I put in the time, and the effort and the training, I, I ask them to let all that work, all that dedication and repetition, let it come out and express itself. Just let, let your greatness come out and express yourself. And for that person, it might be a 150 foot discus throw. And that's, but that is the expression of all that. Let the athleticism come out and express itself in the form of discus throwing, right? And so, um, that's, that's kind of how I try to coach people that have done the work, you know, the people that haven't done the work as much, I have to maybe temper that a little bit because they're still becoming athletic and they're still, yeah, yeah. I still don't even know what that expression might look like for them. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, so that, that book certainly helped. And then, um, working with Gloria also helped what Gloria turned me on to was um and she was a recommendation from dan paff um and this is something again i asked my athletes to do i i, 
I tended and I still tend to be very super hard on myself, my own worst critic. There's, you couldn't, t you couldn't say something to me about my throwing or my training that I hadn't already thought, you know, right. And, um, or judged or whatever. Yeah. That, that's and so, <laughs> yeah, right. Ju no one, no one has ever said anything that I haven't said worse about myself. No right. one. <laughs> for sure and i think that's also partly what drives you to do well and do amazing yeah. things right because because you're like it's never good enough right. but that can also you know become your own poison and so um she said suggested that i keep a journal and and i am i was raised to not write down your feelings because that could be used against you right when people had diaries and stuff i was always like don't keep my parents were like no nah, careful keeping diaries because people could read it and that. so i never did so she's like you need to keep i always kept training journals i have boxes of, of, of training journals in terms of like sets and reps and all that or like this cue work today but she's like you need to write down three positive things about your workout every day and i was like Ooh, I okay like i was like okay she's like even if it means you showed up and I was like, I can do that because there are some days, as you know, when <laughs> like, I made it to practice today or yeah. I made, I made it through the warm up. Cause some days you just don't want to go, especially it's as you get funny. old, you know, <laughs> you don't have to go. It's like, who's watching you, you know? Um, and I found that that was a very powerful tool because those three things every day over the course of a season, two seasons now become a repository of, um, reinforcement and and like good thoughts and it also builds confidence so it helps build confidence for the person that struggles to have confidence because they're so hard on themselves and so over time i was like oh okay i guess i am doing oh i'm doing better than i thought you know because you tend to remember just the crappy things or like you know the throws you didn't make rather yeah. than the throws you did make or the lifts you didn't get versus the throws you did get or the lifts that you did get. So I found that to be a very powerful tool. I, I tell my athletes, it's a, it's a bank account. And every time you write something down like that, you're making a deposit and someday you're going to need to withdraw, you know, and take some of that out. And then at least it's there for you, you know? So that was helpful. Um, so there's that. <laughs> that was great. Um, I don't know if I caught it the the second book you mentioned, what, what book was that? So it might've, you might've. Oh, the, the first one? The first one was, so the, the, were, mag the, uh -huh, the magic of believing. Magic of believing and then the inner game tennis. The tennis. The only two you mentioned? Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the old classic, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale is always a good one. Um, and then I, um, Oh, I could send you a little list too. Yeah. Susie. So anyway, and I'm constantly reading too, you know, I mean, the journey never ends, right? It just takes different shapes. Yeah. I am currently reading The Way of a Superior Man. No. Oh, what what's the what's the premise? The premise is essentially just kind of how to step in i guess to like your full masculinity and in, in all things like it's not it's yeah. not uh, it's not a sexual thing or whatever although that is mentioned it's it's more about like relationships um both personal um at work in general you know what i mean just walking through through the universe um yeah uh, it's 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 really good like i think it's it's offering some powerful tools on communication mm -hmm. um which I think is good. I'm, I'm historically, I haven't been terribly good at communication either, or like phone calls, which is, which is why I am kind of loving like the, doing this podcast now. Cause like, yeah. I'm probably like the people that I like that I have as friends, like I hardly, I never talk on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, mm -hmm. it's not because I don't like to talk. It's not because I don't like my friends. I love my friends. You know what I mean? Like in of this course, being able to connect with um, you because we haven't had a conversation in years. I can't remember the last yeah, time. Yeah, it's been a long time. So stuff like this, like I'm really enjoying and looking forward to um, continuing it as this podcast grows and grows. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about done with that. And then a dude that I'm kind of training 
he's he's a baseball pro um minors and he just got me the book chop wood carry water as like just kind of ah, like, yeah thank you um it sounds pretty cool and um but i haven't I haven't started that one yet but you know I'm, that's an expression that dan paff and i used to use all the time oh yeah okay chop chop wood and carry water it's just like it's like the process right process and yeah, it's just like sometimes it's like just another day at the office you know you just gotta do the work chop wood carry water and then we would just say chop wood all right we just chopped some wood today <laughs> i'm sure there's other meanings that probably i don't know but uh yeah that's i and i've heard that book reference that maybe i'll have to pick that one up yeah cool i'll let you know um when i start i, I probably will start reading it next i'm almost done with the other one yeah. um so I don't know. How much, how are your kids doing? Like, are they, are they up and about and screaming yet? No, I, I'm, so I, we live out on a, a walnut ranch. Um, and so I'm in a shop detached from the house. So they're like, oh, yeah. they're probably wondering where I am, but it yeah. works fine. They wouldn't come out here on their own. Yeah. yeah. I'm hiding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what's, what's your, I want to say like, what's the greatest lesson learned I guess, mm -hmm. over the career. Um, yeah, I'll just ask that. What's mm -hmm. your okay, that's a tough question. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, yeah, that's a good question. It's funny because it's sort of a, parad a paradox because um, in some ways I had so much confidence in, in I don't know if arrogance is the right word, but you know, to be a high performer, you have to have a, a high level of confidence. And, um, you know, I, I watched part of the um, interview with Marcel and even what he was talking about being a, a new dad and married, you know, you have uh, the challenges of being a, a, an athlete at this level um, focus and how it's hard, you know, he's athlete first, then husband and dad. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's really true. Um, but I, I think the thing that the distance from being away from my career now and being, you know, a mother and uh, just, you know, the maturity that comes with evolving as a human being, I wish I hadn't been so insecure, you know? If you hadn't uh, been, you said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's funny, like I said, because there's some things I wasn't, like I was very confident in my abilities to throw far. And there were certain things I just didn't even care if people said certain things, it didn't matter. But I think there was an underlying, and maybe it's just the human condition, like there was an underlying desire to wanna be like accepted or validated by my performances. And, um, and at the end of the day, it's like, that would be, it's like a false God to worship because there's no, it's not about that. You know, it's about, for me, at least looking back, it's like, and it, well, and it was, it was about, you know, how much could I get out of myself? What was the best version of Susie that I could possibly be uh, to throw far? And I think I, I think I mostly met that challenge and accepted it. Um, but I wish I hadn't worried so much about what other people thought. Yeah. You know, and so looking back on my career that's one thing where i'm like oh man that was dumb like no one really cared anyway <laughs> <laughs> or no one cares as much as we think right like when you're and, and part of that is that sort of whole egotistical i'm i'm out to accomplish i don't give it f what anyone thinks this is what i'm doing and you need that but um you know if that could have just been tempered with a little more like ah, it's gonna be okay too you know but um so looking back, I think I wish I would have worried less a little bit about what people thought, you know, about my throwing or whatever. Um, and also looking back, I'm very proud of what I was able to accomplish um, with my size and strength, you know, strength. Obviously, I was a great athlete, um, you know, God-given talents and that sort of thing. Um, and so I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to challenge myself in one of the world's greatest arenas, yeah, you know? <laughs> and but, so, yeah. yeah, I just, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to test my metal. And um, because when you stop, 
there's other ways to test yourself, certainly, but it's not so black and white. You know, it's right. not so either you do or you don't. Um, it's there's more gray, and uh, at least in the at least in my experience. So I do miss sort of the brutality of either you do or you don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, but um, so as far as a life lesson, there's two. There's like too many to mention, but I would say, you know, I wish. I, and I try to remember that even now, because it's not like, oh, all of a sudden you don't care about what people think or being validated by some other things, right? Like I get insecure as a coach sometimes. I'm like, man, maybe I'm just not a very good coach, <laughs> you know? And that's not really true, but yeah. you know, I still have things to learn and improve on. And so I'm trying to take those lessons I learned as an athlete and also apply it to, you know, my abilities as a coach and as a mom too, you know? So I don't know if that answers your question very well. I wish I had a really good like package, no. like, well, can we, the answer is. <laughs> one, two, one, three. Um, I don't know. What the answer is there is no answer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, that's what I was saying. Um, um, uh, so after. Kind of oh, sorry. Sorry. It's kind of segueing into um, like, what would you tell your younger self? Like, I think you have identified some things, some topics, perhaps. Um, so I guess like, it can be the final question or whatever, or you can hit me with some if you want. Um, what would you tell your younger self now to kind of those humps that you wish you kind of ignored or whatever um, as an athlete? And honestly, at any stage of your career, like when, when was possibly like the most integral part now me listening to this i would say it was probably like 98 or sorry 99 i guess going in going into yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um hmm. what so what would old susie tell young susie <laughs> what would now susie yes <laughs> oh god um i uh, as it relates to throwing not necessarily no no Hmm. I think I would have had kids a little younger, you know. Uh, I had my first kid at like 37, so maybe a little younger. Um, that's what I tell younger Susie. Huh? You have two? I have two, yeah. Um, shoot, that's a hard one. You have to edit this out, me just stumbling around trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> I think kind of what I touched on earlier, just, you know, try to enjoy the process without worrying about all the bullshit, you yeah. know, and the bullshit being what you think other people care about when they don't. Right. And, and no. what you think you care about, but don't. Right. Um, you know, I, there's certain parts of my career where I think I could have focused more, you know, I could have um, had a better diet or not stayed out as late with Jared Rome going out to have your drinks after a meet, you know? I mean, I think about those things in retrospect, not specific, I'm just kind of teasing because, um, you know, God bless Jared. But there's some truth in that. It's like, I mean, that was, we had a lot of fun too, but it's like, you know, maybe I could have um, reeled a few things in here and there, but, um, or not been so uptight, you know? Uh, but that's also part of the, the, the growing process so um you know i'm not sure exactly what i'd tell younger Susie, except that maybe just lighten up and don't don't take other people so seriously you know i think that's probably pretty perfect <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah it's as good as it gets right now kid boy yeah yeah all right well, <clears throat> i'll see you again in 10 years and see what happens yeah exactly <laughs> how about you kid boy what's driving your bus right now making you want to throw again uh now, now it's my podcast <laughs> um the uh, unfinished business to a certain degree uh -huh. um, and also and that's that's more result driven um mm -hmm. and the result not in in a number the result in a metal you know what i mean like i i mm -hmm. went i went to dr b for i don't know what three reasons 80 meters uh, Olympic medal, uh, mm -hmm. 
well, two, I guess. I don't know what else I was thinking then, but. Um, Those are good ones. And yeah, and I and I reached all the other the the other two or three levels, but. It, and you like Canadian chicks, I heard. I so you know, like that's Canadian another good reason to get. I don't know. There's something. For, <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and and so I always kind of knew that I was probably going to throw again going into 2020 unless I had a job where my employer was like, no, you can't. So like, mm -hmm. so I never filled out, you know, the retirement forms or the papers and made it official. And yeah, me either. Try to tease and be like, you know, you were always coming back. And I was like, yeah, I told you I was, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Only stipulation yeah. if I had a job and, and, and someone was like, no. So, um, and that's what it is. And, and like, and stopping throwing in the first place was, was not, I don't remember who I was having this conversation with, but it wasn't because I couldn't, I was honestly just kind of bored and like. Totally. Yeah, there wasn't. No, I totally understand. Yeah, it's like, uh, what, did, what did you just say? Like the, the life and death or like testing the metal. Like it, I, I wasn't, the environment around me wasn't very, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, difficult to, Mm -hmm. going to USA's and to continue placing top three and to continue making teams. Um, and I think I kind of missed the time of like, I might not make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. In the whole year doing all of this training, get to USA's and like, and you know what I mean? And get eighth and like, and that was just the best you had that day. Right. And so like, I, I just kind of got accustomed to, you know what I mean? Always being in the top three and making yeah. it. No, no, I was just bored. That's, yeah. that's what so like, and now like being away, I was, think I was away almost two years exactly. And like the fire's back and it's feeling really good. And yeah. Just, and, well, and it sounds like you're enjoying it too. And that's so important. And I, and I totally understand and relate to what you're saying about being bored. I, I was interviewed by, um, I can't remember which podcast it was off the top of my head, but I think it was throw big or throw far. And, um, you know, I was like, I had to go out and expand myself as a human being because you know you do this for so long and you do get bored i mean intellectually you need a different stimulus Stimulus, and, yeah. <laughs> you know it's like i don't know there there's more to life and, and um uh so i totally understand and i think it's very invigorating to come because i had also had a break actually before i went back to 2012 training uh 09 was like a hangover from 08 it was just a disaster of a year and i got injured and then came back to training in the fall of 2010 and actually through 63 meters in 2011, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, um, but that last year and a half of training for the 2012 Olympics um, was really fun. Yeah. And I really, I focused very well. Even my husband was like, this is the most focused I've seen you since like 2007, 2008. And I'm like, yeah, cause I'm like into it. When before I was just like mailing it in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> which sounds horrible, but you know, if you're not engaged mentally, you're not engaged mentally. And that's just like, there's your sign, right? Like there's your sign to, <laughs> to move on. Um, and so I just want to say, enjoy it, Kibway, have fun. All the, all the things that you wanted the event to be, have it be, you know, and now. follow your instincts. Right. And even in my last year, I still kind of let some of those old, um pesky insecurities get me a little bit and uh but overall i i really enjoyed it even though i wasn't throwing as far because i i don't know i think i've lost some confidence along the way and then also sorry my right hand's getting tired from holding my phone um and so i don't know man just enjoy it really truly I, and you know what my biggest f up was in 2012 it was, I could, I, I actually done some really nice technical changes because unlike what you might hear, you can not teach an old dog new tricks. You can change technique. I, think, I know. I don't. Till yeah. the day you die. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, so if there's a technical change you want to make, you're going to, you can totally make it and you're going to be, you're going to be strong. You probably have already noticed this. It probably will take you, well, since you started really training in, it probably took you six weeks to feel strong again. Like where you're like, I'm really strong again. Whoa. 
Honestly, you I know? think it was. I think it was less. Yeah, like I probably mean, for you, of course, it would be <laughs> yeah. less. But, You're like, it was actually six days, Susie. I started Tuesday, then by Saturday, I was like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I threw, Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I mean, I haven't thrown anything like crazy far in training, but honestly, in the last, I don't know, five years or so, I haven't anyway. Um, but I threw over sixty-nine meters, like within, I want to say within four weeks of yeah. getting back again um and that's coming from my last like well or let's say since i've been in florida my best in training has been like 73 50 74 maybe and my yeah. last two or three seasons i was throwing 76s you know what i mean 75 so like that's just right uh, that's i'm like yeah i'm, I'm doing all right with however many <laughs> for sure life. for sure um, yeah so where like, i blew it kibway and I don't know how you can, if you can take anything away from this, was John and I, I was working with Godina because John was down in Scottsdale. It, I think it was World Athletic Center, World Throw Center at the time. I don't remember what he was calling it then, but it was just a good training environment for me. I needed to get out of, I mean, I was, I was still living in Modesto, of course. My, you know, my husband and family are here. But I needed to get into like a professional environment where I was around other people pushing themselves. And I had yeah. Rachel Long Floors was my, yeah. So anyway, I would train with John Scottsdale. We made some technical changes that were actually really working well. And I could, I just could not freaking trust it through the power position and discus where like, I just probably like a millisecond of patience around the right side. I would just pull that left side too soon. Cause that's my, that was my trigger. Right. Like, yeah. um, and anyway, long story. So I was third at 2012 trials, but I didn't make the A standard. That was the year that they did that. And maybe they do it now still. I just don't pay attention. That really tight window of like this date to this date, no chasing. And I've thrown 63 meters the year before, blah, blah, blah. I should have thrown 60 freaking one meters that year. So like I didn't deserve to go in some ways, you know? Um, but I was like, M F because the following week I did a camp for John and then we went back to Gill um, and did a competition in Champaign um, or yeah, somewhere in that general vicinity at the Gill facility. And um, at Sac State, I'm throwing 210. And I'm like, what? Literally the week later. Yeah. And warming up at Mac Wilkins had a meet out. This is way back, you know, at Concordia. And I was throwing over well over 61 in warm-ups and so there there you go here's yeah. a seasoned veteran who just did not trust the technique enough when the name was called to execute the position and get it done and um literally john and i both cried uh, this at sac state when i had that practice it was just like are you kidding me <laughs> you know it's so uh annoying but God, so just like trust yourself, Kibway. Have have the faith and confidence to to do whatever it is you're trying to work on. Because, man, you can you can totally kick everyone's. Ass. I mean, it's not about that, but you know, you can totally do this. <laughs> I, Susie, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I remember, so, like, I don't remember exactly what we talked about back in the day, but like, <clears throat> it was like, it's always kind of been these like like just super awesome chats about you know life and throwing and like throwing isn't life but like yeah it kind of is you know what i mean because it is kind of a reflection yeah of what that's right actual life is about and so i've i've always appreciated that over the years yeah um, i mean if you were um <clears throat> you know living at home by yourself in a basement and this is all you did at age 38 i would be like you know wait we might not <laughs> yeah. i'd be worried yeah. And, but you know you've gone out and expanded yourself i mean you know there's more to life but it is an important i think expression of yourself and your and your athleticism and your journey and you know you can't do it forever and nor do you want to do it forever yeah. you know mm -hmm. um but yeah man just enjoy and i'll be i'll be cheering for you and sending good thoughts your way and and yes. hoping you put together just a really beautiful set of throws this season Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I feel like this is probably a good spot <laughs> to, um, to wrap up. Um, 
do you have anything like any final thoughts are you you are on social media now and like in the last year you've kind of been a little bit more prevalent so. yeah you know i really sort of avoided facebook for i don't know you know i've got my ideas but um i really enjoy i think instagram is more suited to my attention span because i'm like oh picture <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh a picture and just a few words excellent um so yeah i've been enjoying enjoying instagram um so yeah i'm on I'm on the Instagram machine what and is post it? periodically. Uh, Susie Powell Roos, I think is my, cool. is my uh, handle. And then um, I'm starting a little uh, throwing club called USA Throwing, just probably for, you know, just kids around our area. And then we'll have a website, usathrowing.com. And I think it's just going to sort of be my outlet for um, what I've learned in the sport. Uh, yeah. So it's like, I have this nagging, like, um, you know, tapping on my shoulder where it's like, you just, you need to share this, you need to get it out. And I've, yeah. I've been kind of insecure about that too, Kibway, as you can oh, relate. Man. It's like, <laughs> cause you make yourself vulnerable. And like, even what I just shared about 2012 Olympic trials and that season, like, I don't know that I've shared that with very many people because it makes me it like the competitive Susie, the ego Susie is like, well, that makes you look weak. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, oh, well. The, the truth is every elite thrower listening to this can relate to that on some level. Absolutely. They've had that experience, you know, at some point in their career. So anyway, that the website and, and, you know, the social media aspect of that will just be a way for me to get some of this stuff out there. And it, hopefully it's helpful. And, you know, I can get that tapping, nagging, Susie, you need to share this with people uh, <laughs> off, least, off my chest, you know? You know? I mean? yeah. yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I feel that to specifically to hammer but throwing in general as well um yeah and i want a club too i don't know at some point obviously it's got to be called like you know 40s club throws club since everything else is being called 40s lately <laughs> is it is that is that trending uh, i do well, like I, it though I, I, yeah, i'll make a trend like shoot oh yeah. hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay boy, that's great well, um, again, so many, so many, many thanks. Thank you for uh, being on the show. Thank you, Kibway. Thanks for all that you're doing. Thanks for, you know, how you're promoting the sport. And, um, you know, you've got a fan out in California cheering for you. And say hello to Crystal and the family. You kids don't know me, but, you know, hopefully yeah. our paths will cross. Yeah, maybe. Uh, in the yeah. Near Go future. to trials. Yeah. Go to trials. Yeah, or if you're ever out in California. I mean, I know you come out, but if you ever want to train out, with, out here, you're more than welcome. We we'll always yeah. have a place here. Next time we got to come through. I know it didn't work at Christmas time this year, but um, yeah, because that's not a busy time for anyone. It's not a busy time for anyone. <laughs> yeah, you know, grandma runs the show, so it's like, hey, grandma, no, I'm gonna go see him. No, we got to go see so and so out in, you know, whatever. You get the idea. Yeah, you got to keep grandma happy. <laughs> I get it. I yeah. totally get it. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, cool. I think All we'll, right, we'll wrap up here and. You have a good day and like get with your kids. They're probably looking for you. <laughs> yeah, they, it, 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 they'll be fine. All right, Kibway. Thanks so much. Good luck this season. All right, Susie. Thank you. Bye. See you guys <laughs> later.